Hello everyone, welcome back. Uh, thanks for tuning in, checking it out. We are on location in a new location tonight, uh, broadcasting live from none other than the Walmart parking lot. Uh, <laughs> by the time I was able to get started, there was just no way I was gonna do it with the lighting that I had at home. So I'm like, well, where has good lighting? Oh, Walmart. So gonna head on over to the Walmart. So anyway, that's where we are. You know, I was, I was thinking about this. There's this really crappy country song that I remember hearing a long time ago that I was like, this is the cheesiest crap I've ever heard. But I remember the hook was something like, yeah, we sure did learn a lot in that Walmart parking lot, which, uh, wow, that's really good. Although I'm pretty sure it's true to life for a lot of people. Now, I don't remember one of the things they discussed learning um, any, was anything about their political ideology or philosophical ideology, but maybe, you know, after this video they could add that to it uh, because that's what we're going to be talking about here in the Walmart parking lot. You know, I could have done this earlier, but I just couldn't peel myself away from watching the the Chiefs just destroy the Broncos in that crazy snow they were getting down in Kansas City. So anyway, here we are. Um, you know, I really wanted to do this video today and I didn't want to put it off because it's it's the continuation from the one I did last week, which was why I'm not a Democrat. And so, I, you know, this is kind of part two, why I'm not a Republican. But for those of you that didn't see the last one, you know, I kind of discussed my political journey, my um, where I started out, the way Bridget Patassi put it, I borrowed a um, kind of a, a metaphor from her, which was, what default settings people have. You know, if you buy a computer or, or a phone or whatever, there's the default settings and how some people start out, you know, with their default settings flipped to Democrat or Republican or whatever and don't really know why their settings are on that and how I kind of, based on where I grew up and the family I had and everything, my default settings were, you know, I'm team Democrat, even though I didn't really stop to think about why I'm t team Democrat. You know, it wasn't something that my identity was, I'm a Democrat, you know, all this other stuff, you know, I've got the buttons and shirts or whatever, anything like that. Um, it was really more like if you grow up in a family and everyone's Lakers fans, you know, and it's just kind of like, yeah, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I like the Lakers or whatever, but probably couldn't make a list of like the top 10 favorite things or, or why you really love the Lakers. Um, that's kind of how I was with, you know, being on Team Democrat. It's kind of like, this is my my setting, this is the default team that I'm, I know that I'm a part of, but I don't really know why that's my default setting. Um, and so it was pretty easy once I became kind of disillusioned with that to just flip off that switch of Team Democrat without having to really flip on any other switch for any other team. Um, and so to kind of put a fine point on where I was and what brought me to kind of where the, the journey I've been on for the past few years, is and and what sets the stage for this video is that I wasn't pulled over by the right. I wasn't on the left and then all of a sudden the right just became really appealing to me and so I was like I'm not a democrat anymore. I'm a republican and I was just really convinced to be a part of that side. That's not what happened. It was more of a being pushed out by the left from the left. And so Whenever you're pulled over by the right, that's where you end up. If you're pulled over, if you're convinced to be a Republican, but if you're just pushed out of the left, you just kind of find yourself wandering around in the middle. Um, and so that's kind of where I was whenever I began this kind of new part of my political journey, ideological journey, you know, however you want to say it, you know, several a couple of years ago, maybe two or three years ago. Um, and what really sets the stage for what we're talking about here tonight is I was watching this podcast uh, the other day. So Eric Weinstein uh, has a podcast called The Portal. It's really good. It's really dense stuff. So you got to like take it in pieces if you're not as smart as he is, which is like everyone. The dude is totally brilliant. But he did a conversation with Sam Harris the other day and both of them are from the left and are highly critical of the left right now because of the same stuff that I kind of talked about in my video last time and stuff that you know, I've talked about you know, before in terms of just dishonesty or, you know, misapplication or what or one-sided application of principles. So anyway, but one of the things that Eric Weinstein says in this interview with Sam Harris is he says, what we don't really understand 
is that there's a homelessness problem that is really significant. He's talking about an ideological homelessness problem, a political homelessness problem. He says, if you're the sort of person who feels the need to attach to some kind of institutional structure in a time when there is no institution that holds your perspective, you're going to start to do some very bizarre things. The thing about you and me, and he's talking about Sam Harris and himself, is that I don't, and he said, I don't think we do this long term, but we're okay being homeless, right? You know, sort of first principles, kind of think your way out of it. But it's very tough for most people. And so what Eric Weinstein's identifying there is something that I can identify with, which was I found myself kind of politically homeless, ideologically homeless. I was like, okay, so I guess I'm not a Democrat, but the Republicans just nominated this Donald Trump guy, so I don't think I'm a Republican either. You know, and I've even thought about this because I think it's an important question, at least that I wanted to ask myself, which was if I, so let's take me, me now in 2015, 2016, you know, who would I have voted for? What would have been my perspective then? And I think that th there's actually a good chance that I would have been a never Trumper, if I were to be really honest. Um, now, I think maybe only through the primaries, but I, I, I'm pretty sure that even through the primaries, I probably just wouldn't have voted. Um, you know, I need to think more about that. But the point is, is that even now, as I think about like what I identify with, who I identify with, it's still more about founding principles and stuff than it is teams. And that's, that's what I want to talk about here. And, and that kind of, again, leads into why I'm not a Republican, because I found myself politically homeless, but it's, it wasn't like, oh my gosh, I'm not on the left anymore. So I'm going to go run screaming over to the right. Because as Weinstein uh, correctly identifies here, I think, is that we live in a time when there's not much institutional trust with any institution, um, Democrat, Republican, different like parts of government even, whether it's the courts or the judiciary, which well, that would be the courts. The courts are the legislative right now. Um, what's going on with the impeachment? There's not a lot of trust there. Media outlets, there's not a lot of trust there. Tech, whether it's Google, Twitter, Facebook, whatever, there's not a lot of trust there. And so there's not a lot of institutional trust. And so if you're a person who feels like you have to have some institution to attach your identity to, it's a really difficult time to just kind of orient yourself, but I'm not one of those people that feels like I have to have that um, institution to uh, attach myself to. So that was kind of a to my advantage once I got pushed out of the left. And I think one thing that really informs this is that at this same time I was going through seminary, getting my master's, and you know, kind of one of the things that people would ask me at the end of it or during it even was, you know, what did you learn or what's kind of some of the most important takeaways from this experience and what I would consistently say and what I still consistently say is, you know, I'm kind of done with isms and ists if it's not in the Bible. Um, because one of the things I realized is that, you know, if you're, especially if you're familiar, if you're, once you kind of be, if you become a Christian, I'm sure this is in other religions as well, but the, there's significant theological differences within Christianity and people can, ha and especially if you're really steeped in the theological world, People have kind of their own pet doctrines, pet theologies that they can kind of attach themselves to. So it's a Calvinist or Armenian or Reformed or premillennial, postmillennial, and or all of these other things. And so, if you even within that realm of Christianity, whenever you start attaching yourself to those things, which by the way, whenever I first became a Christian, I found that to be a really tempting thing to do, but. What, the minute you do that, if you say, well, I'm a this thing or I'm a this thing, you have to start giving out the kind of disclaimers of, but I'm not this part of it or I'm not the most extreme version of it. Um, and so as I was you know, moving away from the left towards the middle, I was already experiencing this kind of rejection of broad overarching isms and ists, kind of superordinate identity markers. Um, Especially ones that people don't know what you're talking about whenever you say it, or at least not everyone does. So for example, if I say I hold liberal values, that means a different thing to so many people that, that no one's going to have a consensus of what in the world you're talking about. And so I found that with the theological things. If you said, why well, adhere to this doctrine or I like this doctrine, a lot of people, especially in the theological world, will say, well, what do you mean by that? or which parts of it. And so you kind of have to tease that out so much 
that it almost becomes counterproductive. And so I was already moving away from isms and ists and all of those types of things. And so whenever I found myself in the middle, I, w I wasn't looking for some new thing for my identity to latch onto because I was growing weary and, and I was just cautious of doing that because I had already witnessed some of the problems you run into whenever you do that. Um, so anyway, so that I carried that into whenever I started thinking about what I believe politically, what I believe from an ideological standpoint. And so what I, what I started to do, which is kind of what Weinstein hinted to in that um, quote, which was think about, well, what are first principles? What are the things that I value? Um, so I, I don't really care about Democrat or Republican because those are just an, those are supposed to be just organizations of values, organizations of beliefs, organizations of policy, ideally undergirded by those values and beliefs. So all I did was think about, okay, well, what is true? What is what are the what are the things that I think are most important, and then build up from there. You know, kind of again to use the the theological metaphor what I did at the end of seminary was I was like, you know, the thing I'll just identify with is Jesus as the most important fundamental foundation of my faith and then just build up from there. So when it comes to the political ideology or, or governing ideology, okay, well, what do I think is the foundational things there that I could build up from? And since at this time, you know, and now, but especially whenever I was really thinking through these things for the first time, some of the issues were shoutdowns, chaos on college campuses uh, in, uh, in response to certain speakers coming to campus. And so I was like, free speech is a must. Free speech is incredibly important. So the First Amendment, free association, freedom of the press, all of those things. So I started orienting myself, I think, more towards at least consciously. I think I would have always said I subconsciously adhered to this. But I started consciously orienting myself towards the concepts of liberty, personal liberty, individual freedom and rights. Um, so the ability to dissent, to say, hey, I don't agree with that and not experience you know, crazy amounts of um, violence and threats just because you disagree. Um, I, I started thinking about just the idea of facts over narrative. Um, you know, One of the things that, again, that Weinstein and Harris identify here and that many other people have identified, um, especially over the past couple of years, is that it, it be, has become increasingly obvious that many in the mainstream media are more activists than they are journalists. Um, now, not, not everyone is, is like this, but there are many who are, especially in the past several years, who have transitioned into what appears to be some type of an abandonment of principles, just you know, core journalistic principles, um, in favor of, well, I want this to be true, or this is the narrative that is most important, and so I'm going to advocate for this. There was recently a piece, uh, actually I don't know how recent it was, in the past couple years in Data and Society about uh, strategic silence in the media and how you know there is actually a strategy of we're not going to report this and that's kind of a way of being biased. You know, if, if this doesn't support whatever narrative we want to put forth, we're not going to report it. And how this is an actual strategy being used in pretty much all of the mainstream media outlets, left and right, whatever. And so, regardless, the point is, is that one of those first principles also that I was thinking about is, okay, who seems to be or what, what seems to be focusing on facts versus who or what seems to be focusing on narrative. And so that was something also, I was like, if, if a person seems to be honest, and that includes about their bias, by the way, I think anyone that is, says, hey, this is where I'm biased, um, but I'll just tell you what I think, you can do whatever you want with it. I trust them a lot more than I trust those that aren't honest about their bias and try to present themselves as neutral, even if they're not. Um, so those are a few of the things that I started thinking about. And I realized more and more, at least for me personally, that my beliefs were starting to kind of coalesce around maximal rights, maximal freedom, uh, maximal liberty of the, of the individual to kind of make their own decisions, live their life, govern themselves as they see fit. Um, and I, by govern, I mean make their own decisions, not like oh, if you step onto my property, murder is now legal. That's not what I'm talking about. But I just mean general self-governance. So that's where that's where some of my stuff coalesced. And so again, going back to the title of this video, why I'm not a Republican, is 
that that doesn't check every one of the boxes of things that I believe in. And just like with the the with theology, and whenever you start adhere saying, "Well, I'm a Calvinist or I'm a this thing or whatever," and you have to give disclaimers every single time. Well, I think it's the same way if you make your identity structure, I'm a Democrat or I'm a Republican. So kind of, in essence, I'm not a Republican for the same reason I'm not a Democrat, because I think there are some, you have to say, here's the principles, I'll vote for whoever represents these principles. But honestly, on a practical level, I do have some serious criticisms of the right, of the movement of conservatism lately, um, particularly maybe over the last 20, 30 years. You know, I think that a couple of those things would be, you know, Previously, it seemed like the Republican Party was supposed to be the ones of fiscal responsibility. And, you know, we want small government and we want to be responsible with our money, but that doesn't really seem to be a value anymore. There, there ha is, in this administration, there has been some reduction of uh, regulations and government entities, but they're still blowing out the spending. They don't really care about entitlement programs. And so that'd be one where I'd say, I couldn't check the box to say I am a Republican because I care about, I actually do care about fiscal responsibility, not just those who would pay lip service to it. Now, again, in all fairness, no one on either side seems to care about it, but it, but the Republicans used to say they did, and I think some still do say they do, uh, but that, that's just not in the actions. Another one would be, I think this is a big one, especially right now, is um, that, you know there's kind of a a culture war, not now, that it's been over for a while, but maybe ended, kind of came to a close in the 90s, you know, or maybe late 80s, but where there's kind of this moral majority and there is this kind of general, if you were to say there's a basket of conservative ideals, basket of conservative policy and legislation, what, what I think was an absolutely catastrophic mistake, it was so foolish, was that the conservatives generally as a as just a you're say here's a, a policy platform they took things that were objective that you could make objective scientific cases for but that there's also a moral basis for that I would say like abortion would be in that category that, that that's not a subjective opinion you can make a scientifically rooted case for why there should be regulation there or completely outlawing it but they included in with things like that anti-sodomy laws railing against violence in video games and rap music and things like that. And so they tried to legislate subjective moral opinions, even if some of those are ones that I agree with, but those are subjective along with objective things. And so they put it all together as this package deal. And I think that's one thing that delegitimized the pro-life movement for quite a while was that it was, you know, kind of whenever people thought about it, it was all part of the same conservative legislating or morality um, just bag of crap, basically. And we're seeing a resurgence in that with there's this kind of recent debate online among conservatives about uh, regulating or banning pornography on the internet, which is like, how do you, do you know how the internet works? Like, why are you even talking about this? But even more fundamentally, like, you can't do that. Like, e even if you can make a good case for why it shouldn't be there or why it's harmful, the minute you start legislating your own subjective view of morality, you can't, you cannot make a rational case for why the left can't do that. That's just a problem. And so I think that there is some cognitive dissonance in some people on the conservative side who want to legislate certain aspects of their own morality, but then that are subjective, but then have a big problem whenever the left wants to legislate their morality. Um, which is subjective in a lot of these cases. So those would be some specific instances of that. I think another thing that bothers me, and I'm going to do a whole video about this other part, um, but I'll touch on it briefly, is some of the defenses of Donald Trump, particularly from Christian conservatives. Um, you know, because I think that one thing that there are many on the left that will put forth, that I think is a very disingenuous um, criticism, and I reject the premise of it entirely, but they say, well, how can a Christian vote for this person? How can they vote for this person? And again, I think the premise is all wrong. Um, and I want to do a whole video about how those who are Christians, how that should inform how they vote. Um, because I think there's actually a, a pretty robust topic of conversation there. But there are Christian conservatives that will respond to that and say, well, no, no, no. Donald Trump is actually, I think he's saved. I think he really is a Christian. I think that he's this. Or they'll make some comparison to King David or something like that. And I'm like, no, that's foolish. 
you could you should reject the premise, but don't make these other arguments. They're they're wrong. Um, on their face, they're wrong. And to try and contort, or you know, if you squint really hard at it to make a case that Donald Trump is some you know Bible reading you know, Christ follower, I think is absolutely absurd to even put forth. And so that'd be another example of things on the on the right that I'm like, I I just cannot sign up for that. I don't agree with that. Um, I just reject that entirely. And so that'd be another reason why I wouldn't check the Republican box. But again, those are just a few of the nitpicky things. I could say I have another list of things for the left, which I've went into numerous times before. I'm not going to go into that. But the point is, is that, you know, again, bringing it back to kind of the theological metaphor, any, if you're a person who's a, a faith, maybe, whether you're Christian, Jewish, I don't know how it works necessarily whenever it comes to uh, mosques and the Muslim community, but at least with Christians, you understand that the odds of you finding a church that you love everything they do, that you believe everything that the pastor says is very minimal, that you're going to agree with every single thing the pastor says, um, and, but you still have to find a church to go to. And so I think that there are people who they'll, they'll say, instead of saying, well, I'm a Baptist, I'm just going to go to the Baptist church. I think the more prudent thing to do is to say, well, what are my theological beliefs? What's the most important thing to me in terms of how I worship? And I'm just going to go to the church that does that, that preaches those things, you know, or, or what preaches that the most and where the disagreements are minimal. And so I think it's the same reason, or the, I think that same type of pragmatic um, discretion whenever you're thinking about what your political team is should apply where it's like, okay, I might have a different set of ideals personally, um, but I still have to vote for someone. So, but I need to figure out what are the things that matter to me the most and just vote whoever represents those in the same way that a, a person of faith might say, here's my beliefs. This is what's most important to me. So if it's the Methodist church in town that embodies that the most, so be it. If it's the Lutheran church or the Baptist church or the E-Free church, whatever, so be it. Um, I, that's the one I'm going to go to. And so I, that's, that's where I would say that that's the same reason I don't hold a denomination that I say I'm a part of, even though I go to a church that has an affiliation, but I wouldn't say I'm a this thing because what matters most is those foundational theological principles, the same way with the political parties. I think we have to take a step back and say, what's the most important founding principles to us? And then who checks most of those boxes in any election? And so even though I would say I'm not a Democrat or Republican, probably nor will I ever be one of those things as a superordinate part of my identity, there is utility in having those things. We still have to organize. We still have to have people to vote for. And so, you know, so be it. But again, I, I think that if what your driving mentality is, I am a this thing, and so I'm going to vote for this thing, as opposed to here are the ideals I believe the most in, and I'm just going to vote for whoever represents those ideals. I think that, that you're going to get in trouble if you go with the I'm a Democrat or team team Democrat or team Republican as opposed to I'm team free speech or, you know, it might be I'm team compassion or I'm team or whatever that, obviously that's subjective. Um, but I'm team helping people in whatever means that I think is, you know, the most effective way of doing that. And so whoever I think is going to put forth the policies that will help you the most, I'm going to do that. So anyway... That's why I'm not a Republican. It's also why I'm not a Democrat. And why I would, I would encourage you to think about, well, whatever team you're on, think about why am I on this team? Um, what are the, not so much, what do I, not so much, what do I hate about the other side, which is the driving factor right now. And I do think there's utility to that, by the way. Um, but I think it's more important, not so much to know what you don't believe in, but to know what you do believe in um, and to, you know, maybe just be willing to just for a minute flip off that default setting of Democrat, Republican, whatever, and think about, you know, just make a quick list of what are the ideals that I think are most important for governing our society or for not governing our society? Um, what In what ways is there governance that actually hinders society? Um, and if it's a policy the Republicans are really all about, then don't vote for them. If it's a policy the Democrats are really all about, don't vote for them, whatever. Anyway, um, so those are just kind of, that, 
that's why I'm not a Republican. Those are some of my maybe issues I would have with conservatives lately. Um, and, and one part of that, by the way, back to the pornography thing, that there's been this discussion about banning porn. Um, what is really fascinating to me about that is that the right lost the culture war because they did all those things I was talking about, putting all these things in one basket together. Um, but that they're trying to do it again, or some on the right are trying to do it again. And it's like, no, this is why you lost the cre the moral credibility in the past because you tried to legislate your own subjective morality. Um, and then now you're getting mad when the left does the same. No, it's, it's not how it works. But the idea that they would use the same tactics that caused them to lose the culture war, you know, a couple decades ago now is really fascinating and, and baffling to me at the same time. So that, that would, that's just one of many reasons why I'm not a Republican. But again, I'm also not a Democrat. And if I were to say anything for why I'm not either of those things, to put, again, to put a fine point on it, it's because I think that the most important thing is to establish the first principles and say, I adhere to these principles and I don't care what team is the one putting it forth. If tomorrow some Democrat says, hey, here are the things I value and here's the policies I'm gonna put forth and they check most of the boxes for me, I will support that person. If Donald Trump does that, then I would say I'll support Donald Trump. I don't even necessarily know what Donald Trump believes or puts forth as a set of principles or values, so I'm not sure I could ever even make that call. Um, but the point is, is, is follow those principles, not so much the team, um, so to speak. And so, anyway, to kind of close it out, again, just to kind of give you a window into how I think about things, um, generally, I, there's a term that I like, so even though I said I don't like using things that most people don't know what you're talking about, um, whenever I think about this for myself, there's a term that I've heard before and it hasn't really caught on, which is fine, I don't, I don't care. Um, but I, I haven't found a better one that en encapsulates what I believe, which is this term is conservatarian. Um, and so what, what I think of, what I mean by that is, I definitely, in terms of my own personal beliefs, the way I orient myself, I, I lean more conservative socially for sure. Um, but at the same time, I'm libertarian when it comes to governance. I, there is very little of my own morals that I would ever want legislated, and it would never be anything that isn't like something that we could agree on. Like, you know, for example, it's a moral imperative that I think that murder should be illegal. That's a moral imperative. I'm okay with that moral being legislated. Um, but things like, I think that the government should be completely out of marriage entirely. Let churches can do whatever they want. This person can get married, this person can get married. I think they should remove the tax write-off entirely from, or tax exempt status for churches outside of their charitable work and remove that incentive and say, okay, you can do whatever you want. I think they should legalize marijuana. Think that a baker can bake a cake for whoever he wants to bake a cake for and not bake a cake for whoever they want to bake, bake a cake for or not bake a cake, you know, whatever. And if they are a total bigot, then they'll go out of business. Um, so that's what I mean, but I wouldn't want to legislate any of those things, even if I disagree with certain social things, even if there's certain things that I think are really catastrophically bad for society, um, I wouldn't want those things legislated because I can't make a case for that outside of my own personal beliefs. I could say, well, here's what the data says, but whatever, man. Like, I, If I don't want someone else legislating their morals onto me, then I can't say I want my morals legislated onto them. So that's where I like that conservatarian thing where it's like, yeah, I might believe this personally, but I want the government to be as small as possible so that people can have the most freedom to pursue whatever things they want to pursue. Um, and I was listening to an interview or a podcast the other day. Uh, and actually, I wouldn't have listened to it in the first place, but I commented on Twitter. Uh, it was like Chris Hayes' podcast. And he was interviewing the person who came up with uh, Elizabeth Warren's wealth tax, some French economist named Gabriel Zuckman. And I think my, my comment was something like, no one in the comments here knows what a wealth tax is uh, or why it's a bad thing. And Hayes actually responded and he said, hey, we cover that uh, in the podcast at length. And I'm like, okay, fair enough. You want to listen to it. And I was listening to this thing and it was absolutely terrifying. They were basically defending or advocating for some of the most destructive policies of the 
20th century to be implemented here in the 21st century in terms of just top-down government planning and organization, um, just ba basically, st basically structural communism. Um, but one of the questions Hayes asked Zuckman was he said, well, what would you say, you know, in terms of there are people like Bill Gates who, you know, this guy is curing malaria in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, you know, he would say, I'm better at spending my money uh, than some government bureaucracy is. So just let me, you know, give my money to the charitable organizations or in whatever endeavors that are I, I see fit because I'm pretty good at doing that. And I'm better at that than government bureaucracies, which by the way is true just factually in terms of how much of a dollar in private versus public charities um, actually go to the cause. And so it's a question about the efficiency of money being spent to help people. And Zuckman answered his question. He says, you know, the problem with charity is that it's not democratic. And this idea that we can just allow wealthy people to spend their money however they want is just kind of outdated Victorian mentality. And so we just need to get past that. You know, we're in a new, we're, we're in a new day and age. We have, we're, we're in this big, we have the, we've put forth the welfare state. And he was saying this in a good way. Um, so we need to get past that. So I, I hear things like that. And I think that's absolutely terrifying that whenever asked a question about, well, what, what's the most effective way to help people? Zuckerman is like, it's not about the most effective way to help people. It's about who determines how the money is spent. And charity is not democratic. So who cares if it's more effective whenever Gates spends it? That's, that's not what matters. So to kind of close it out, that, that represents everything that I am terrified of, that I hate. And I don't care what causes Zuckman would want to spend that money on, even if it's causes I like. That kind of oppressive, top-down, totalitarian governmental control, I think is something that I orient myself away from that, no matter who it represents. And by the way, there absolutely is, for example, those that want to the government to come in and legislate the pornography on the internet and restrict that and to, you know, we're going to create these entities or whatever to make, make it where that's restricted. Or um, another example would be, at least on the, on the right, would be uh, there are those who want to um, restrict and have agencies over big tech, over Google and Facebook. I want the government to stay the heck away from Google and Facebook. I don't want that, but there are people on the right advocating for that. So that's why I'm not a Republican, why I'm not a Democrat, because no matter which side it is that says, we want the government to control this thing, I'm against it. So anyway, I, I, since I'm tired, I, I kind of start rambling sometimes. So I'm going to probably start to close it out there. But the point is, is that for me personally, I'm a conservatarian. I have conservative personal beliefs. I want the government to stay out of your life, though. I don't think that you have to adhere to the beliefs that I hold. I don't want to be forced to adhere to the beliefs you hold. Um, whatever it looks like for the government to be the size necessary for a functional society, but no bigger is basically what I personally believe. Um, but at the same time, there is utility and you got to just find a party and, and vote for them in an election while not attaching your identity to that party. Um, anyway, so that's why I'm not a Republican. I don't know if that makes sense. It's kind of a opposite statement of why I'm not a Democrat, you know, or it's not an opposite. It's the same. It's because I don't think there, that it's good to attach to either one of these things. Um, but I do have specific criticisms of the Republican Party and of um, the right more generally, which I've hopefully I've been able to explain some of those here. Um, like I said, I do want to make a video about just the lens with which Christians, I think, should view voting, view elections, and, and how do they deal with those questions of, well, how could you possibly vote for a blah, 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 blah without getting into exaggerated, you know, clearly false arguments, at least when it comes to Donald Trump, about him being this legit believer. I think that's absurd. So I want to make a video about that. I think the next debates are this week, I think, maybe here in a couple days, actually. I think they might be the 16th. I think they're Tuesday, Tuesday or Wednesday. So I'll make a video before that to talk about the candidates and how right now that's the debate stage is, is so white and how that's a big thing right now. And, and there's been a, increasingly more articles written against Barack Obama, against Pete Buttigieg. And so 
I I think it'll be interesting again as this progresses to to really take a good look at and take seriously the divide occurring in the Democratic Party, because again, these are two irre irreconcilable views of the world, and that's what we're seeing play out on that debate stage. Whenever Joe Biden says a thing and Bernie Sanders says a thing, they couldn't be more, farther apart. Joe Biden is as different from Bernie Sanders it, uh, as he is from Donald Trump, to be honest. Um, he actually might be more different from Bernie Sanders than he is from Donald Trump, actually. So anyway, I want to talk about that. I'll probably do some video before the debates. I don't know when it'll be. Um, probably the day of the debate, to be totally honest. Uh, yeah, so that's it. If you have any questions, um, if there's anything in terms of just my own political journey, how I look at things, you know, my just kind of rejection of Democrat or Republican generally, feel free to shoot me a a comment or a question or a message or anything like that. I really like engaging on these things. Hopefully it helps. You know, my goal isn't to just give some testimony about my own political journey or my own ideological journey, but to say, look, I think this is something that's not just useful for me, but I think it's useful for all of us to really not just, it's, you know, if you end up saying at the end of the day, I've thought about this and I am a Democrat or I am a Republican, great, but I think we need to know why we check these boxes, why we say we're part of this team instead of the other team. And so to really just stop and, and make that list of what are the most important principles to me and then use that as the lens instead of, well, whoever is the Democrat and whoever is the Republican. I, I don't think that's as useful. Um, so anyway, yeah, if you have any questions, comments, criticisms, please leave them in the comments. I appreciate you watching this even though I'm in this Walmart parking lot here at, you know, it's scary stories to tell in the dark. Hopefully we sure did learn a lot, or at least I know I talked a lot in the Walmart parking lot. Um, yeah, if this is the kind of thing you like, please follow me on Twitter. That's at my mundane mind. I'll put a link in the description. Be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel. That's uh, at return to reason. And I'll also put a link there. Um, yeah, so that's it. Thanks for tuning in and I will see you next time. Peace.